I don't know what your summer has held, but on the July long weekend, Rose and I loaded up the vehicle and we headed west because our son was getting married. And so we went out to BC and we had a great time at Levi and Tamara's wedding. Now, this was a remarkable experience for us for a couple of reasons. One is, um, Tam is Cambodian Chinese, and we had the joy and the delight of experiencing uh, a Chinese tea ceremony for the first time in our lives, and I found it incredibly moving and meaningful. I don't know what your summer's held, but the other thing that we did after our um, time in BC is we found our way to the lake, and there's not much I like more than an early morning or a late night by the campfire. And so yesterday, as on other days, um, I made the coffee at 6 a.m., went out and started the fire. By the time the fire was going, went back in and the coffee was ready. And I sat and I was thinking about this morning. What do you think about when you sit by a campfire? For, so, for some of us, we're grateful that we weren't sitting by a campfire yesterday because we were planning to go on the meeting place camp out weekend, but uh, Spruce Woods, I think, got 76 millimeters of rain last night. So welcome this morning. You're not at Spruce Woods, you're here. Um, but I was thinking at the campfire about what I was going to be sharing this morning. I'm, I'm reading the story, and we're going through the parables of Jesus, the stories of Jesus. And every parable has a point that Jesus is trying to make. And, and the point in our parable today comes out of a question that's asked in chapter 19 of Matthew. And, and, I, and I thought, I need to talk about that more. So I didn't actually have all those slides prepared for, for this morning. So you probably want to put your hands up and get, an, get a Bible, one of the house Bibles from one of the ushers, because we're going to spend some time in chapter 19, which aren't on the slides, before we get to the story that Jesus tells in chapter 20. And the ushers would be glad to to hand you a Bible. As you're finding your way to, to that scripture passage, let me ask you, which is on page 800 and Matthew chapter 19, 800 and something. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, have, have you ever made a bargain with God? It goes something like this. God, if you will, then I will never again. Or God, if you will, then I will for sure do this thing. Have you ever made a bargain with God? Usually we make bargains with God when our backs are up against the wall, when we've painted ourselves into a corner, when the circumstances of life are such that we figure there's no other option. God, get me out of this jam. God, solve this problem. Have you ever made a bargain with God? I have. The crazy thing about bargains with God is he keeps us to our word. He, he actually says, oh yeah, you're about that? Great. There's a whole tradition in the Hebrew scriptures about people who make vows. Do you think God makes bargains with us? Has God ever made a bargain with you? In the Old Testament scriptures... The Hebrew people had a bargain with God. And he says, basically said, I will be your God and you will be my people. Now, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Be, be focused on these things and live them out. And if you do, you will have prosperity. The, the basic bargain in the Hebrew scriptures was this. If you follow my word, you will be blessed. If you follow my word then you will be provided for. And one of the signs that you are following me is you will be prosperous. You will have peace. This, in fact, is something that, that has really been difficult in the life of followers of Jesus because out of this teaching comes what we've often called the prosperity gospel or a health, wealth, success gospel where the sign of God's favor is that I'm doing well financially. But Jesus turned the page to a different kind of arrangement. And, and in turning that page, God set a new way of relating to him and a new way that he relates to us. So, there was a man 
who came to Jesus and he asked this question, which we can find in Matthew chapter 20, in chapter 19. And he says this, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? I, I want to I make sure that I understand what the terms of the bargain are. What must I do to get eternal life? I just want to be clear. And Jesus says, well, there's one way. Um, keep the law. Keep the commandments. And he goes, well, well, which ones? I really want to be sure. I want to make sure that I'm getting it right. And, and Jesus says, well, you know them. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the Ten Commandments plus love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes, all these I've kept, said the young man. What still do I lack? And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect... Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. He was prepared to make a bargain with God, but he was only prepared to go so far. You see, if the sign of God's favor was financial prosperity, he had already achieved that. According to the bargain, he had kept the law, and the results in his life were prosperity. And he wasn't willing to walk away from that. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because they've got a bargain mentality with God. Do you have a bargain mentality with God. Do I have a bargain mentality with God? And the disciples, who thought exactly the same way as this rich young man, said, who then can be saved? If he can't be saved because he's got a bargain mentality, like, really? Who then can be saved? And Peter, realizing that, you know, this actually might be work out in his favor. He says, Jesus says, with man, all things are, imp this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And Peter says, we have left everything. We've left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? Have you ever thought that? What will there be for me? And a little bit later, Jesus says, anyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. What kind of bargain have you struck with God? So Jesus is getting to a story. The question, what must I do, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life, is now answered with a story. And Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven is like. Those words, for the kingdom of heaven is like, occur 31 times in Matthew's gospel. Another five times he refers to the kingdom of God is like. For the kingdom of heaven is like, this is an insight into how God operates. It's a, it's a new way of doing things. It's not the old, I'll do my part, you do your part, and we're good. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day, and he sent them into his vineyard. Israel, the Jewish nation, was in an economic depression. The majority of the Jewish nation did not own land anymore. It had been taken in tax seizures because they couldn't afford to pay Roman taxes. So they were all day laborers, and a denarius was a fair wage for a day laborer. About nine in the morning, 
This vineyard owner went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he said, you also go work in my vineyard. I will pay you what is right. So let's note this. The first time, I'll pay you a denarius. The second is, I'll pay you what is right a couple hours later. Then he went out again at noon and at about three in the afternoon, and he did the same thing. At about five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been here all day long doing nothing? Now, think about this. If you're all day laborers and you're, you're depending for groceries, you're depending for providing for your family on the work you've done that day and you've had no work, the question is, how do I go home and explain this to my family? That tonight, it's rice and beans again. And so they're standing there waiting. They're sitting around waiting and And so he sends them into the field. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. Now, Now here's one of the interesting twists in the story. Nothing in this story so far is particularly unusual. But who pays the last first? You, 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 you settle accounts with your most faithful employees, with your most trusted workers first. And the workers who were hired at about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. They got a full day's wage. So when they came, uh, so when it came to those who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they had received it, they began to grumble against the landowner because they had a bargain. And their bargain was the one that was specifically stated. That bargain was that we will work for a fair day's wage. But there was another bargain going on in their hearts, that we will be treated fairly. When my kids were small and we gave one of them one thing and gave another, another thing, inevitably, one of them would say, that's not fair. Yeah. These were, they, they, the sense of fairness meant sameness, or fairness meant that, that I would get something because I worked harder for it. Like, everybody has in their own minds a definition for fair. And, and these workers also had a working definition in their minds for what fairness was. Now remember, this is a story about the kingdom of heaven. That's not fair. They, they had struck a bargain in their hearts was, that was different than the agreement that they had with the landowner. If you and I have spiritual agreements with God, is there another working bargain that's happening in our lives that we maybe haven't talked about? The bargain might go something like this. If I follow Jesus, then bad things won't happen to me. (laughs) Have you ever made that bargain in your heart? That's what you believe? Well, it doesn't say that in the Bible, actually. But it's the way you think. Or, Or you might have a bargain in your heart that goes, if I work hard enough, then God will think very highly of me. If I am moral enough or ethical enough, then surely I'll be on God's favorite list, and I will get ice cream at the end of the day. If if I am someone who serves the poor or pursues causes of justice, then surely I'm in God's good books, and it'll pay off for me in the end. What kind of bargain do you have working in your heart that maybe you haven't spoken out loud? Or maybe you haven't even acknowledged to yourself, but it's shaping the way you and I live. So they received and they began to grumble against the landowners. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of work in the heat of the day. But the landowner answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who has hired last 
the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? And so, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now, Jesus is saying this having just heard to people who've just heard a dialogue that he had with a wealthy, young Jewish man who had a bargain with God. The same bargain that every other Jewish man and woman had. That is, if you do all the right things, if you follow the religious laws, if you keep up the religious practices, if you are moral and ethical, God will show you favor. That was the bargain. And Jesus says, something new is about to be done. God will pay the last just as much as the first. This is good news for everybody in the room who is not Jewish. Because God is offering everyone, including the Hebrew people, a new arrangement. Where not based on your performance and my performance, we have access to the generosity of God in ways that we do not expect and, frankly, do not deserve. So, what bargains have you struck? If you're an employee, you have a bargain with your employer. It's probably in the form of a contract. It might be up for renegotiation every now and then, depending on how your union might work. If you're a business person, you will have a bargain with a client where you will provide a certain service and they will provide you a certain compensation for it. If you're a parent, you make bargains with your kids far too often, don't you? And then you go, now what do I do? And sometimes you find that no amount of bargaining will even help with your kids. Mm Mm-hmm, I heard that. We are bargain makers including we are spiritual bargain makers. When I do something that is morally wrong, it's ethically iffy, I feel guilt and I feel shame, and so I should. Those are are reminders in my life that, that something is deeply amiss. But there's another part of me that says, man, I just screwed up the bargain. And if I just screwed up the bargain, then my relationship with God is in jeopardy. And when I screw up the bargain over and over and over again, then all of a sudden I realize that that this fire of faith that's in my life has maybe got a lot of cold water poured on it. And, And the word of encouragement here is that God is not a bargaining God anymore. That God is doing something new that offers me, regardless of my moral and ethical failings, regardless of my religiosity, full and complete access. See, the the story is about what must I do, what good thing must I do to receive eternal life. And, And Jesus is saying, my friends, it's not what you do The kingdom of God is like the landowner. It's what the landowner does, who shows a generosity to all people regardless of the good effort they've put in to receive it. Now, all of this sounds like good news, except many of us, like Monica shared earlier, have mindsets that really are more powerful in our lives than the biblical story. We've allowed this narrative to be more powerful that that God is gracious and generous and merciful. And instead, we've believed a message of self-hate or we've believed a message of hard work or we've believed a message of, of moral superiority or we've believed a message of do good stuff. And that will keep my relationship with God wide open. The good news is that Jesus has done and is doing a new thing. 
And so I want to invite you to, to take a look at words that we can find in the book of Ephesians because this understanding that God does new and incredible things in our lives is taken by Paul the apostle and he speaks to us in the church and says, my friends, this is how it works now. He says, as for you, in Ephesians chapter 2, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Your morals and your ethics, they were killing you. In which you used to live and when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is at now at work in those who are disobedient. It's not just about the things that you were doing. It was the loyalties that you created in the process. You created loyalties with God's enemy in the process. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires, like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. In the old bargain system, we, we really couldn't stand up and lay any claim to God's promises. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. Say that with me. It's by grace you have been saved. I want you to say it again and think carefully about the words that you would say. It's by grace you have been saved. It's not what you do. It's what God does. Because the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner, not the day laborer. The kingdom of heaven is like the landowner, not the one who's worked long all day or the one who's just worked the last couple hours of the day. The kingdom of heaven is like the generosity of God. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us within the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And here we have it again. Say it with me. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's not from your bargain keeping. So that no one can boast. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For too long, many of us, maybe, maybe all of us, have lived with secret bargains. Secret bargains between us and God. The bargains that we don't even tell our best friends. The bargains we don't tell our spouses and for sure not our parents or children. They're bargains that are interior stories that tell us that either we deserve something and somebody else doesn't or maybe even more damaging that other people might deserve God's love but not me. I don't deserve the generosity of God. I want to invite you to stand because we're going to sing a song right away. And it's a song in which I want you to consider God's grace in your life. What he's invited to you, you to, and what he offers to you. He offers you, in Jesus, the answer to a young rich man's question. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? The good thing, the only good thing that you and I can do is to receive the good thing that Jesus did. The only good thing you and I can do is to receive the good thing that Jesus did. And so today, my invitation is for you to maybe Pull out the bargains. Hold them in your hand. Take a look at them physically right now. Look at that bargain 
and say, it's yours, God. And with your other hand, receive the goodness that Jesus offers. You see, that's where eternal life is. God so loved us that he sent Jesus to show us his grace and mercy. If never before you have invited Jesus to change your circumstances, if never before you've declared your loyalty to Jesus, then today I would invite you to do so. I'll be sitting up over here in the corner. You can come sit beside me. We can chat. And if you've got secret bargains, then today I, in, I encourage you, I implore you to get rid of them so that you can experience God's grace again this week. Sorry. <laughs> what do you do if you make a bargain with God and you break the bargain after he has done that which you've asked him? Hmm. Uh, okay, that's a great question because I sort of threw it out there and kind of backed everybody into a corner. Um, th this is the beautiful thing about Jesus' work is that in the end with the cross, he ends the bargains. Jesus' death and resurrection ends the bargain-keeping economy spiritually. From then on, it's only uh, God gives, we receive. That means that we need to go like this to receive. Amen. But there's no more bargain-keeping in God's economy. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand, and I want to send you with a blessing. Our series is on parables, stories by the campfire. Your life is a parable that Jesus is telling in our world. Your white life is a parable that Jesus is telling in your home. Your life is a parable, and you are not the main character in the story. Jesus is. Go in peace. And tell the story. If you'd like to pray with somebody, a few of us will be here afterwards, and we'd love to do so. Have a great week.